Welcome. This is the June 19th OpenZFS production call. We have Andrew, Jan, Antonik, Stu, Daniel, and myself. And let's see, I'll get to this little idea from the leadership call. That was kind of cool. But Andrew, it sounds like you've got something. Um, this is a kind of personal thing. I've got my um, lab system I've I've set up and I've been working on trying to get um, home directories exported from its uh, ZFS array. And I've been having a lot of trouble, with, or at least a little trouble, I, I haven't been trying for that long, with, um, with the permissions on that array. Um, and specifically, I'm trying to export them to a Linux host. So- From a Lumos? I'd, yes, from a Lumos to Linux. So I don't know if anybody has any experience with that, but if they do, I would be welcome in hearing their insights. What is your ACL mode on the Illumos ZFS side? Good question. Um, I don't have them. I, I'm not at the machine. That's like I said, it's my sure. home machine. Uh, so speaking from TrueNAS land, look at ACL mode. Uh, that can okay. be... You know, it's either, hey, let's go POSIX or let's let uh, the ACLs from both Linux, Windows, et cetera, all take over and damn near lock us out of our own system. So one which, interesting. Which, which, which by the way, there's a new POSIX standard just came out. I saw that. Okay. Is there any, are there any highlights to care about? I'm still going through them. Oh. Uh, I, 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 I couldn't find the change log, so I'm doing like a diff Goodness. with my eyes. Aha, okay. Cool. Uh, Andrew, anything else relating to that? Yeah, I was going to say the one weird thing is I do have another NSF, uh, NFS share. Yep. It's just kind of like a generic share. I'm not trying to mount it as a home directory. And that seems to work fine hmm. as just bizarreness. So um... I don't know. Are you using Samba or the built-in SMB sharing? I'm using uh, NFS. Oh, but you mentioned, oh, so this is, oh, no, purely no. NFS, but then what's happy, what's not? It's, um, I mean, it looks like a, like there's some kind of permission problem when I try to do it as a home, as home directory. Oh, specifically home directory. Yeah. So fine otherwise. Oh. But fine otherwise, exactly. Yeah. Okay. I'm ah. sorry if I missed this, but you're using the share and FS option on, on ZFS and it, it works when you don't or, or vice versa? Um, it works. It seems to work for things that are mounted as just a generic mount path wherever. It seems to not like it when I'm doing it for the home directories. And I don't know why. And it is ZFS share NFS? Yes, I am okay. using the share on NFS right. on, on ZFS. Um, does that give you any choice of NFS level, be it V3, V4, O41, V4, O2, or something? Um, I can get both three and four. I am presently using four in both cases. Uh, I'd experiment with the others just for kicks. Okay. Um, Thinking out loud. Jerk, you know? What's that? NFS is such a jerk sometimes. Uh, it, <laughs> it either works extremely well or ex or awful. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's like it's insane one. about like anything like I don't know any up like up you know upward permissions it gives me a hard time like the the previous the implementations I I would imagine it's practically the same thing as the Olympus one but. Yes, I have to kick it 700 times, and then it's like multiple choice which subservices I need to run to make which client work. I have mm -hmm. I have like a cookbook that works for me, but it seems completely arbitrary compared to the demos out there. Right. But anyway, I'm just saying I feel your pain. I I I, I have some Illumos boxes I could test on because I'd be curious to see. I mean, I still need to spend a lot. I I, I just started working on this. Uh, last week, so mm -hmm. I've only really spent one day messing with it. And you use that word uh, Linux. That could mean about forty different things. What Debian? Uh, Debian. It's been through a few different revisions. Mm 
I have updated it to uh, whatever stable is, I think. Which, of course, since it's Debian, is positively ancient. Right. Yeah, well, I think 4.2. Got it. That looks right. Okay. Let's see. Thank oh, you for that. Yes. Then, okay. Sorry. Sure. And Jan, you jumped in with a POSIX comment. You can watch the video for that. Um, John, any topics or questions uh, for the group? Are you playing fly on the wall? Uh, just kind of playing fly on the wall, just listening. Cool. Um, uh, I was kind of curious. I'm sorry. I was kind of curious. Please. It's just an oddball question. If anybody um, has tried using uh, ZFS uh, under um, uh, OpenStack. Uh, Andrew, did you mention OpenStack or was it a different stack? I want to say it was Antronic maybe mentioned OpenStack. Oh, okay. Yeah, we we have a uh, our old our old scientific uh, lab is all OpenStack, and we use it with um, basically the VM fires up and a disk attaches to iSCSI. And it appears as a disk to the VM. And then we do zpool create on that disk that is attached over iSCSI. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's not recommended to do that. Uh, but the only reason why we do it is, you know, snapshots are a thing from heaven. Uh, yeah. ha haven't had issues, to be, to be fair. Uh, th this is all on a... a um, Let's see, uh, the, um, the VMs have a gigabit connection, but the host to the iSCSI is 10 gig. Yeah, the host to, to an iSCSI is 10 gig connection. Uh, we, we haven't had any issues with it. The iSCSI is uh, init not the initiator, the target, the server. The server mm -hmm. is the target, yes. Uh, they are running on NetApp. Uh, so we just create a data set there, uh, and then we pass it on to OpenStack. OpenStack uh, passes it as a disk to the VM, and the VM does zpool uh, create on it, and we use it there for snapshots and, and such. Uh, again, no issues. We've been doing this for around a year now, um, but uh, I don't know why it's not. I assume because the ZFS, you know, assumes it has complete control of the disk, number one. Number two, it's over the network. So, you know, God knows what would happen if any partitioning happens uh, in there. So, uh, but, but but personally, we haven't had any, any major issues there. Um, okay. Yeah. If, if, what are you seeing, John? I, I, I can concur with that. I've, I'm running it over 100 gig iSCSI without problem. So. Okay. Um. One of the folks I work with pointed me at some doc, which I was just looking for the reference to it. I can't seem to find it off the top of my head. should be prepared better. Um, but there's apparently some uh, OpenStack integrations with ZFS now that uh, require uh, passwordless SSH into the server um, exports via NFS that work with the export FS uh, mechanism. Um, and OpenStack will actually then manage all of your uh, data sets and snapshots and everything. And I um, am debating trying to give that a try using a, uh, trying with a FreeBSD backend. I don't know if it'll work. I can almost guarantee you there are going to be some, uh, what would be the appropriate term, Linuxisms built into it. Well, Red Hat-isms, definitely. And um, Michael has 100 gig ice cousin. Uh, what did I type? Oh, lost it. Sorry, lost the um, zero. I heard I so, heard that, but didn't type that. Oop, no, right. just, oh, no it's in the wrong spot. Thank you. Uh, but for that, from that standpoint, there are parts of OpenStack I don't trust, and I am more than happy to script around it. Uh, so, are you willing to name any? Um, I in a couple meetings. Yes. Okay. Cool. I'll bring. I'll. Have that properly documented. Awesome. Love it. Uh, and then is that uh, Debian that's working for you, asks Jan, Stu, 
or uh, another joking it, with pots he didn't trust. Both both Ubuntu yeah. twenty two and Debian twelve. Got it. Cool. Anything else relating to that? Well, uh, the 9P FS uh, client for vidio 9P has finally hit the free BSD tree. Yes, it has. That is great news. Um, and it's tomorrow's snapshot or late today's snapshot. Go ahead, Jan. There's a link the there you important get. part is that uh, for a while now, Beehive, at least in FreeBSD, has had a vidio 9P server as a power virtualized driver. Which yep. even works with Capsicum, so now you have a secure uh, sandboxed um, shared directory, and you can have more than one. And two. With... Two. Sorry. Okay, more than two. Okay. What? No, no. What I was saying, what I was going to say, is to cover the Illumos side, at least as of the current stable for Illumos, we also appear to have that same thing. Oh, I was, yeah. I found it on my on my personal machine, and it piqued my attention, but I haven't tested so, it. Nice. But for now, the annoying problem was that there was no uh, I could say client support mm -hmm. in the FreeBSD kernel, uh, which meant that Stuart could only use it with Linux guests or other, at least non FreeBSD operating system. And now, uh, at least in 15 current, we have a client for this server. I don't know if it has been tested with any other server implementation. And that means you no longer have to share a Zvol, but you can share a directory on ZFS, which uh, allows for once sharing of read-only file systems between guests, uh, but also sharing writable directories between guests and potentially the host. Yep. Uh, um, so you no longer have to use uh, NFS or... Um, It opens up a lot of possibilities. SMB and yeah, exactly. The downside yeah, is, we as the commit message mentions, there is a little uh, impedance mismatch between the 9P protocols, uh, stateful file handles, and the more or less stateless VFS inside of FreeBSD. Because of that, if a process does certain things and order of file opening versus privilege dropping, it's possible that it still gets to use a privileged open uh, file handle, the FI mm. file ID, which is kind of like, think of it like this NFS handle, which is only valid for the duration of a session. Uh, so it's a stateful handle, which is only meaningful within a 9P session, and there's no the state isn't tracked, so the kernel has to use a heuristic. And yeah, that is um, potentially very dangerous to use because okay. you potentially allow an arbitrary user uh, to write files owned by a different user. Hmm. Here we do things. Hmm. But it's a lot easier to fix uh, the VFS and change the VFS layer if the consumer for the code is in tree. So this is a good first step and it's already useful as is. And you're welcome. And Doug's been using it for development work. So even that alone is a valid use case where security might not apply as much. I'm just curious if you can do like beehive dash E and throw in, you know, mount root parameters and other stuff that will get a completely diskless. Well, you can use it as, as if NFS, yeah. If I understood it correctly, the boot ROM can read from it via the EFI boot services. That means mm -hmm. the boot uh, the bootloader gets to read from it, and afterward the kernel can mount it as a root file system. So you should be able to boot with uh, from vitio 9 p without a block device. If Amen. I understood correctly. Hmm. Um, and that could be very useful for something like the uh, Chris, um, hypervisor stuff. Yep. I uh, mentioned it. ESD can even if so as a treating a virtual machine more like a process where you want basically the console a standard in and out. Yep. 
and uh, you then have a direct instead of a file system as uh, storage. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, the uh, the Beehive doc history will show many mentions of this and touch on many of the behind the scenes efforts mm -hmm. that made this happen. But um, this means that you potentially can use clones um, and snapshots with Beehive now. Yes, sir. No, uh, this has been a long time coming. And because you can have more than excited. one, you can uh, use your FS tab to arrange them into yep. um, different mounting orders. Yeah. Absolutely. And oh, small FYI, yeah. inside the source tree is a simple standalone 9P server if you want to get your hands wet in like a Petri dish without the beehive uh, embedding of it. Uh, yeah, but the server part of the protocol isn't. Uh, Plan 9 port also has a uh, glue logic. And um, so does Ganesha NFS. So uh, there are many options. Uh, Ganesha, Ganesha. Anyway, that's one to watch. You will finally sure. build without Python 2 uh, dots. Oh, God. I don't uh, think they fixed something. that on FreeBSD. I, that's, yeah. Let's, yeah someone is welcome to check fresh ports for that, but we're a little off topic. Uh, let's, uh, that will probably get some big coverage tomorrow on the Beehive call, and hopefully there will be a snapshot with it embedded for your computing pleasure. Antronig, you've got some news? Well, no, no, it was more like questions, and hopefully your yeah. answers will help people later. Right. I have a I have a Raspberry Pi. Uh, let's see, it says four model B. Yep. Uh, I think it has either two or four gigs of RAM. Okay. Uh, I am booting it from USB. I tried booting free BSD from the SD card. It didn't work for some reason. But when I when I put the SD card in a USB and I put it on a USB. Uh, it 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 booted fine. Uh, so that that was okay, I guess. And then, uh, to bring it back to our topic, I connected an external hard drive. Please don't kill me. Uh, with with ZFS on it. Uh, my questions are multiple things. If people want to use a system like this in their house, what would be the best practices? I'm assuming hard coding ARC might be a good idea, but I'm not sure. For example, in FreeBSD, it's a best practice to hard code ARC and let's say Beehive make it always wired memory. While in the Illumos community, they're like, no, you don't need to hard code the ARC. The operating system will do as it's supposed to do. Um, another thing is since you know it's very much a slow CPU, is there any point of like disabling um uh compression right so uh that's oh, also another idea yeah uh, another question well it was a question which is how to run a modern um uh, time machine uh with some buffer 19 that's the latest version uh, i asked myself that question two days ago and with the help of reading uh, documentation and a lot of wiki pages i actually got to the answer so uh you know not that, that part has been answered to me. Uh, currently, it's in my hand. I'll boot it back in a couple of seconds, and uh, I'll share the config for anyone in the future. Um, there's that. Uh, side note on the topic of Samba and Time Machine. Uh, if you've changed your password on Samba, and you're trying to connect again, and it says a wrong password, even though you're using your new password, try to change one of the letters in your username to a capital case. That's Appar odd. Yes. Apparently, Mac OS and Windows do a caching on the whole operating system level. Um, Windows has its own thing, obviously. On Mac OS, it's BSM, BSN, BSM, no, NSMB. It's, a, it's called NSMB. Uh, it is written by BSD people back in the day, by the way. Uh, they keep using that version of it. And um, I had no idea about that whole caching thing. Uh, it took me like two hours to figure out why am I able to connect from one Mac, but not from another Mac. Turns out hmm. the password was cached. I tried clearing it from Keychain. It still didn't work. And nothing made it work. Then I tried, uh, you know, change one letter in the username, make it lowercase, capital case, but whatever, you know, just make it different, basically. And as soon as it worked, I'm like, okay, it's definitely this cache thing. It did require a hard reboot. Even a logout didn't help. I tested twice. Hmm. <laughs> 
So I did a hard reboot and then it worked fine. Okay. Um, that's on very, Mac, you say? That's, that's on and Windows. Mac and Windows, okay. And Windows, yes. They do some one, kind of weird credential caching, basically. Yes. Um, one other thing with the time machine backups is on the Illumo side, are, rather than using Samba, I believe our SIFs um, yes. one works pretty well. Oh, that. you have SIF. God damn it. I forgot. Oh, it's supposed to be more performant, right? I. I don't right. know specifically. It's, it, it's, I'll tell it's, you that it's it's built into the it's built into yeah. the kernel. So okay, okay, it's just another implementation. Um, so it doesn't what do, share are you go ahead. When you it doesn't do a lot can. a lot of the additional non file related stuff that Samba does though. So you can't do stuff like printer sharing and and all that happy stuff. Oh. It's just well, file it's sharing. not that happy. Okay, uh, Antrinic, what are you using Samba or some other service that I am Samba? using Samba. I am using okay. Samba four nineteen, the latest oh, one. Okay, which okay, came got out. it. Yeah, um, I used some of the configs from uh, Dan uh, Langel, 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 Langel. Langel. Yep. Lang yeah, Langel's blog. Blog there. Yeah, so Co couple of time machine and stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, couple couple of a couple of uh, flags got changed, so uh, I'll be I'll be updating mine. Um, uh, I'm currently doing the DD to another USB. The the old USB, which had an SD card, was obviously very slow. So I'm now using a real USB storage. Um, so there's that. Um, what else did I learn over that process? Um, uh, this is a more of free BSD thing. I don't know if anyone can confirm this. If you can, I'll be very happy. If you do shut down dash H, aka oh, okay. the system should go to hold. Is it normal that you can still ping it? No, it <laughs> should go that far down that it's no longer responsive to ping. But depending on how smart your NIC is... Because hmm. I, I was I looking at the was... screen, it said like sync, 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 which is what usually FreeBSD says in the end. And like then it was like system is halted, press any key to continue, right? But it was still pinging, hmm. all fine. I'm like, what? And uh, so to test it, I added a, uh, a syslog, a remote syslog, to be more specific, in the rc.shutdown script to, to my syslog server. And I got a message that says system has been now shut down. It was the last line in the rc.shutdown. And uh, I could still ping it. So I was like, okay, I assume it's now safe to take it out. I, I don't know why I was yes. able to. Yeah. But uh, still, it was a very yes. weird... Uh, yeah. You mentioned that you have the uh, Intel X710, Nick. No, no, I'm talking about the Raspberry Pi. Oh, yeah, because I mean, Raspberry yeah, Pi doesn't, doesn't have, have, have a power have a off. Full halt semantics and so on. Uh, I see. Mm. Because I, I just remember that the Intel Nick uh, has some weird shit going on. The it unless you put really beat the firmware into submission, tries to intercept ICMP and LLDP and so on. Mm. And so, so that basically the driver then has to use special messages to get that information mm -hmm. out of the firmware so that it's supposedly easier to work mm. around Windows yeah. brain damage. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do some more testing around this uh, shutdown dash H on like other systems too, not, not just the ARM. I'll do it on the Lenovo's and the servers and see if I can make a matrix, like when the system should be ICM peable, basically. Mm -hmm. um, another thing uh, that it's, it still bites me up to this day um, from the previous topic of, of, of Samba issues, uh, for those who don't know, my, my company runs uh, like a commercial honeypots. And uh, one day, a very large infrastructure uh, started yelling at my face that like all of the honeypots, all of the Samba honeypots are like, you know, under attack because credentials have been used. Uh, and we're like, what the hell? It uh, turns out also a very Windowsy thing with Samba is when Windows is, is shutting down, it will send a flush packet to every Samba share that it connected to over that lifecycle, 
you know, after booting. So if you ever see a, a Samba connection when Windows machine is shutting down, even though it's not mounted, but it was mounted previously, huh. uh, apparently that's a normal Windowsy thing. It will like send that, be like, it's like it's like the sync 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 of Samba on Windows, <laughs> uh, as far as I can tell. Um, so yeah, they still haven't fixed that. Yesterday I tried it again when I was playing around with Samba. I'm like, okay, did Microsoft fix this? Because we reported this to them, and no, oh. it's still latest Windows 10. I'm not on 11 yet. There must be a goal it, of that. What was their intent, even if it didn't come out right? Well, well, according to their engineer that we talked with about this issue, is that uh, sometimes let's say due to a networking partition, the Samba might get stuck. And let's say you have files that are not written, oh. uh, but Windows will try to reconnect in the background, right? So th this is basically some kind of legacy code from God knows when, hmm. uh, that during shutdown, make sure that all of the uh, network drives have been written to, like if there is no more buffers that are not hmm. written, uh, okay. which in this case, it, it represents itself as a single packet going to um, all previous Sambas that you've been connected to, which in case of a honeypot uh, is very maddening, but in case of a, a well, you know, monitor... What is of a honeypot? It's like, what's it, what malicious behavior does it think it is? Oh, it, I mean, our honeypot doesn't do malicious or non-malicious. It just says yeah. a packet arrived when it shouldn't, right? Oh, because okay. no one is supposed to touch the, the honeypot. I'm like, okay. oh, great. Uh, which oh, which en well, ended up being a good monitoring system. Like now yeah. you can know every time a Windows machine has been shut down in your infra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it, it does have a specific um, uh, header in, inside it. So yeah. like you can uh, ignore it if you want, which we, hmm. which we which we ended up doing after, after that incident a couple of years ago. Yeah. The, it, yeah. And the, the Windows machines connect to that many uh, servers because you say it's only the ones that's, reached out to or does it scan the network for smb shares and then no 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 no. so let's say you have a window hasn't even never touched that's you ha you have a windows you. machine yeah. you mounted you mounted the samba share yeah. you disconnected the samba share yeah right <laughs> then you're doing a shutdown during shutdown it will reconnect to that samba share oh i and, see and disconnect yeah okay the one that it was disconnected basically yeah got it got it to share is it yeah it caches all the things all the time exactly yeah 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 and i still don't get that if they do that much caching why is it still slow or is it slow because they do that much caching like it's <laughs> yeah. what's yeah, the opposite yeah. of a chicken and egg problem <laughs> ah there you go Okay, anything else regarding your network? At least the ZFS call is closest to the file sharing call. Um, I guess not yet. I'll be playing around with it. I'm very oh. happy with the performance, to be honest. Like, it took it around five hours to sync around 500 gigabytes. On the Raspberry over, Pi? Uh, on the Raspberry Pi, yes. Okay, cool. Yes, yes. The, the hard drive, uh, and this was a hard drive. This wasn't like an external SSD. It was an external mm. hard drive uh, mm. over USB 3. Um, uh, as far as I can tell, the CPU was the bottleneck, but mm. like 400 gigs uh, in uh, four to five hours, uh, it was pretty nice. And I had a walk outside. Apparently, Yerevan is very nice during this time of the year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, about your shutdown issues, I suspect that is extremely well documented out in the wilds. So there are a lot of Raspberry yeah. Pis out there, and that's a pretty mundane issue. Well, cool. Keep us posted. Uh, this came up on the ZFS leadership call yesterday. It was like, hey, let's add a little better handling for uh encrypted volumes and getting it right. And Daniel, I'd be curious if this helps you out in Zelta. If this is something you've seen, it's like uh, perhaps it was the inability to send in some circumstances from encrypted to unencrypted. But I will, I will leave that to your reading pleasure. And yeah, I guess is, I guess this could oh, yeah. this could come up if I'm trying to transmit from from CFS that. That does one one side does and one side doesn't support encryption. Yes. So I I've been I've been trying to get to more more edge cases like different different OSs and stuff. Um, uh, but I but I haven't done 
uh, done a lot of conversions between encrypted and not encrypted because just in in my world of opinionation, I don't I don't see that as being a particularly common use case, but I want all the use cases. Sure, bless your heart. And Andrew, did uh, Illumina pull in the open ZFS encryption, which is different from the Oracle Solaris ZFS encryption? I'm I'm honestly not sure. Um, I want to say we probably did, hmm. because I want to say the Oracle version was after they closed everything. So I, I highly doubt oh, we would true. have been able. Point. Well, true. I highly they doubt we would have been able to pull in their version. Cherry picked from there. So yeah, it wouldn't be Oracle, but I I wonder if it's open DFS cherry picked in. No worries. I I think I I do believe. I mean, I, I I see the stuff related to it. I haven't done a lot of plague with it. So I think it was cherry picked in from you guys. Oh, sweet. Um, yes, we don't use yes word. Uh, this was on social media a little uh, bit ago, and it was, uh, yes, Jan? The yes word, Spark? Solaris. Uh, Solaris. <laughs> that was funnier, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> because that them. was probably one of the last because I think uh, any still maintained Solaris fork has sunsetted Spark support. Yeah, Triblix, I think I could be wrong. Yeah, I think Triblix still has be, Spark support. And that couldn't then be the last uh, big Indian architecture with ZFS support. <laughs> the just. Uh, Mentioning corner cases for Daniel today. Maybe you can find a 64 bit ARM um, big Indian system. Oh, cool. technically it's possible because it's configurable at boot time, but. Hmm. You can set Indianness at boot time? Yes, during. Uh, okay. So on ARM, uh, oh, it yeah. used to be on 32 bit ARM that it was an unprivileged instruction to spell Indianness. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Which was the what way could... you did Indian conversion. So you stored, swapped Indian is loaded back. That was sounds good. Yeah. Cool. Okay, that can wait for the uh Solaris call. Uh these uh what livability topics came up. Uh, and maybe they re might well huh, maybe they will resonate with you, Daniel. It sounds like hey, let's try to get a few more capital R's in there, perhaps to avoid some Xargs magic. Uh, ZFS destroys ZFS snapshot and label clear. Sounds like uh, they'd hope to automate that. Have other users encountered that being restrictive and needing Xargs? Um. I, I just don't like mentioned the inconsistency. That, uh, that ZFS snapshot and destroy dash R only work for the child snapshot, which were part of the same atomic recursive snapshot. So the problem here is that it's not easy to answer what's the least astonishing correct behavior. Let's say I have a ZFS pool, I have a file system in there with two child file systems. I take a recursive snapshot. I create a third child. I create a snapshot of the same name. I recursively delete the snapshot on the parent. What does that mean? Hmm. Does okay. that mean all child uh, snapshots with all snapshots with the same name on this data set and its children? What if a child doesn't have the snapshot anymore because I've already destroyed it. Is that an error? What if it never had it? Is that an error? No, it isn't right now. It, we, uh, ZFS internally knows the, which one of the child snapshots were created as part of uh, the same recursive create command and targets only those of the same which still exists. But uh, in my opinion, that is technically reasonable, but can be very astonishing. And mm, interesting. Uh, because you destroy a snapshot recursively and still have it. 
um, or you try and you can potentially lose all your data doing that because you've created the snapshots over time, you do a recursive then and it's not recursive and then you destroy it. The data set recursively and it will destroy it all. Uh, <laughs> Because if you do a dash r uppercase recursive to also do spread snapshots, that will work on the on the file system. So let's say you want to replicate a file system and it's snapshot by snapshot recursively and it doesn't work as you expected, and then you destroy the source when you've still lost data. So there is no I see. perfect answer. I know. Except maybe detect this and make it an error case if it exists so that yeah, or a very loud warning or something, or a flag to toggle between the two behaviors. But hey, historically, it is what it is. You can argue yeah. that snapshot managers should use recursive snapshots and really take the maximum recursive, but that doesn't have the use case if you create the snapshot recursively and then create a new child data set and intend to uh, add the missing <clears throat> snapshots for things like this is part of this set of, yeah. So it's a bit annoying that you have to mess around with this. Yeah, okay. I know uh, I personally have a rule. I absolutely positively never do a delete with a capital R. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, but um, I don't do it on systems where there's something I wouldn't miss. As far as I'm concerned, that is way too dangerous of a flag to ever use. Well, yeah, I, the only time I use it is to clear an entire pool because I'm doing something right? with it. Like if I'm Just wiping dash, out a whole Uppercase pool. R dash uh, force and then... Uh, and yeah, mount for file it. systems too, and so on. I really destroy everything, destroy the clones derived from it. <laughs> it's just uh, okay. look whatever you have to. I don't care. Okay, and the next one uh, should holds ever be, I guess, automatically created uh, to 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 do based on a snapshot name. Let's see. Would create a hold with a tag directly extracted from the snapshot name if that would create the very first hold, obliviating the need to supply a tag. Ah, I'll mentally I'll call that auto holding, but I could be wrong. Any observations there? Cool. No. Not real sure I understand what we're talking about here. Yeah, it, well, it made sense to them when they wrote it. And hopefully they'll chime in. Hopefully they're watching as soon as this publishes. And then I guess also looking at holds releases would release the hold given on the if there's only if there's one hold obviating the need to extract the tag. Okay, so a little more automatic handling. It's the hold. Mm. Snapshot when there is only one. Can I, can I just say I'm offended by saying that shell script ripe wrappers are a bad workaround? <laughs> 90, <laughs> Amen. Oh, yeah. Well, they're a bad workaround if you want to um, maintain autonomous. Uh, autom I miss you know what I mean. Mm. Yes. Thank you. I, I agree. I was tongue in cheek. Mm. But 90% of production work eventually. Absolutely. <laughs> and if you're scared of that, mm. you might want to reconsider your job options. Yeah. Amen. Goes there. Okay. I'll call it that there. Okay. So, um, yes. If you want atomicity, uh, you can use a, for at least snapshot creation, you can use a ZFS channel program. Program? Yep. Okay. With ZFS, 
The annoying part is I found out that you can't create clones or new file systems in that. Oh? I would, yeah, it looks like the API just doesn't exist. Um, clones, uh, you can't create uh, file systems, I think. You can't create, yeah. Uh, Daniel, do you have any insights there? Or have you not tried general programs? No, I haven't. Is that a bug? Interesting. Uh, that it, those are nifty new technologies that the average user has probably never heard of. Cool. Antoinette, I gave you some Raspberry Pi feedback based on my uh, experiences from a few minutes ago. I happen to have a 14.1 image within reach. Congratulations. It took you a while to figure out the HDMI thing. Like, the, what, the week? I you were like, this. Oh, I called Fred Finster, who's been all over the... Oh. Stuff. So, and he was like, oh, so it was port. really just the secondary exactly the port. But we're off topic. Anyway. <laughs> so, we're always off topic. ZFS topics. No, they're all eventually related. They are. But the images ship with, I believe, UFS. Let's see. No. Z pool status. Nope. No pools available. Ha, ha, ha. So... Uh, one housekeeping note, I will be camping next week such that uh, our loyal compatriot, Antrenig, may be hosting. I'll try to drop in, but you never know. Let's see, 26th. Other fun topics and excitement and adventures and stories to tell. We got weird stuff. Oh, I like weird stuff. But it's, it's CFS related. Oh, all the, all the better. Yes. What you got? So... So Same here, but so part of, yeah, right. So part of my uh, mission in life is to is to deal with replications between really weird situations. So so something that can happen in FreeBSD, and I think it's possible to do it terribly accidentally in Linux, is you use the uh, the the OpenCFS package such that. I detect a version of the ZFX, ZFS executable, which is actually different from the from the pool. And actually, I guess that's, I guess that's maybe not that weird. Because if you like import a pool and then you don't upgrade it into into your local system, there's a mismatch between the the tool the tool version and the the um, you know, and then the options on the on the uh, you know uh, on the actual pool itself. So the options in the, the utility versus the options in the pool, yep. there's a mismatch. Uh, it's possible to go in, in either direction. So in, in my scripts, I, of course, do some level of belt and suspenders. So I check the options in ZFS send and I check the, you know, and then I check the property list to see if it, you know, if it makes sense. But I guess, I guess the question is how backward compatible is ZFS and how bad is it? when there's a mismatch between utility and uh, and pool. Um, because this is really easy to do in FreeBSD. All you do is install the package and then your default ZFS script or ZFS utility might actually be the wrong version or the one that you use to do all your- But it's creation. generally newer, right? It's generally newer. Well, right, but the utility that you use would be might, might be the user, you know, the user, uh, user bin ones. It might oh, not be the so it might it. accidentally grab the wrong one, like with path. No, no, it's not whether it's it's like in the path. Like, like did you did you remember to make sure the user locals are first in your in your path? Ah. So there's a risk that you're using a, an older version of the utilities versus uh, okay. versus everything you got in the pool. Right. Typic typically, the utility will always be newer. Right. Um, or most of the time, so, you know, unless you've just if, yanked a bunch of box uh, discs out. Um, hmm. If the utility is newer, you should be fine. If the utility is older, it sh you may not be fine, but it should right. tell you yeah. that, hey, I don't understand this. So yeah. you shouldn't get silent failure or data corruption, but some things may not work. Exactly. Um, the other that's, thing you could do, because you're in a shell yeah. script, I assume you can use switch dash A to search the whole path and then run all the ZFS commands you found. 
uh, and ask them for their version and find if either one is a perfect match with the kernel version, then use hmm. that. Otherwise, I might, I might need a, uh, use the newest or something like that. I might need a, a, Zelta, a Zelta doctor source target command to tell you what is weird between the two systems. Or uh, oh, you just, uh, <laughs> in the config file, make it possible to provide the ZFS uh, and ZPool command paths. Yeah. And right. Daniel, you probably know. I mean, path is... Or but if the path is set, then then that that's solved. Like if there's some setup in advance, then I can in, trust that. In I can theory, trust the you could use SSH to push the path environment variable. Yes, but that has to be it, allowed, and it can get really yeah, complex if you have SSH certificates because you can then wire down the environment variables via the SSH certificate and so on. But hey, uh, that yeah. I mean, now I'm now Almost I'm making ninety nine point nine nine percent of yeah, situations yeah. because it's only a situation where the where the administrator knows enough to get the the stuff off of the old ZFS box, but not enough to properly configure um, you know paths in the environment on the other side. So maybe maybe that, maybe I'm now maybe that's now edge cases upon edge cases that I don't need to worry about this year. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, as uh, Michael was typing in there, is that's kind of was the whole point of the whole feature flags thing, was that you don't end up in a situation where you've got this feature and it's majorly changed the on-disk format to the point that it's a problem. Right. Well, it's no, just, unfortunately, no. that's not that that transparent to user land. Um, like, you can there. see the feature flags, but then that's not necessarily that doesn't necessarily line up with which like ZFS send features I have access to. Like dash, dash C, I could see something as compression, but it doesn't actually, it can't actually replicate the raw compressed stream. So there's yeah, like right. weird things that happen in these, in these, uh, you know, magical, horrible situations I'm creating on my servers, intentionally, <laughs> of course. Uh, for the point of the, the recording, note that Many newer air quotes, newer pools can be imported read only if you don't support all the feature flags. So that's one nicety, but I don't know if it actually warns about that. You just have to know that it says it's incompatible, but it might go in read only, which, hey, if you're evacuating systems, that could be useful. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Of course. Uh, I have a question from one of my students who has joined one of these calls before. Yes. Uh, however, why can't I find the link to this call? Jesus. Uh, it's at the top of the doc. Here's the doc. I'll put it in chat. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's in, it's in Discord. Should we kick like people? I mean, it does, it will pop up. Uh, it's on, it's on like a Discord schedule now, which oh, is really cool. Fancy. Yeah, yes. I have Dis Discord actually pages me for the call now, which I love. Okay. I mean, it's already <laughs> on my calendar, but, <laughs> you know, belt and suspenders. Wow. So uh, my student got images like these in his, what was that thing? True NAS? Free NAS? Yes. And, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 one sec. Uh, okay. I think these are, oh, you, you can have, oh, multiple pictures. Oh, that's nice. Okay. So, um, so. Going where? So, in the dock. Wait, they oh. are not in the. Oh, it says it says saving. Okay, I guess that's the right. uploading equivalent of, of. Uh, Boom. Uh, okay. Boom. Okay. There you go. Okay, so he got that, which said failed. Mm -hmm. See, it says the remaining zero point three lifetime and error. Okay, then this pool net zero state is degraded. Obviously, that's the Z pool output. And then finally, uh, you know, some self-test stuff, the continuation of the smart output. And one last one was uh, the whole list of the smart output. So he sent me this very worried, which I mean, I would be worried too, honestly. And uh, we, did, we did zpool uh, status-v and we saw that there are errors with the right 30, uh, sorry, 74 of them. Uh, my initial thought was, well, it could be the disk, obviously. Um, and I contacted their uh, department head. It, they, they are a government uh, 
agency. Yes, I am actually moving multiple government agencies to to free BSD and, and, and ZFS, which makes me very happy. Mm -hmm. And I ask them, when are the disks from? How much on the load are they? And his answer was, well, these are not on production right now. We're still testing it. And the disks age are around one to two years old. And the previous system uh was like not booted we had the system we never used it so I, my thought was okay probably not the disk error um then we went into d message yep just like michael is typing in uh we th there was nothing in the, the, the in, in like, like usually if, if if there's like a disk io error you would see something in there like you know disk is lagging or whatever uh, nothing in there as well we did the smart ctl manually with the long run um uh, the long... the output the error output like the dash a and x or simply a test no we talk uh, there's a flag where you can say to do long yep. online test yeah test correct but you do want the actual information that can tell you quite oh, a bit. i see so yeah i'll uh, check I see. here and it's oh it's basically tea leaves to be read but it's a lot more helpful than no information Thank you. I'll, I'll ask my student for that as well. Um, so it that might, wasn't. Mm -hmm. It might also pay off to uh, the smart control should actually output the uh, manufacturing date of the drive. Yeah. Yes, it should. Um, so you can compare that yep. to what how old they said it was. And I note you're using the sys driver, so I'm kind of assuming these are HP based drives. If not, yes. I, tell me to shut up. Um, yes. I would check the firmware version of that exactly. of those drives and make darn sure that they're upgraded even if you have to boot them into windows or linux to do it um i've i don't use the sys stuff anymore um and i've had problems in the past similar to what you're describing um i would which check was the, exactly would my thought i would um, definitely check the the firmware and the and the mm -hmm. actual hours on those drives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, uh, uh, and 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 uh, one more thing when I, when I was looking at it I'm like 64 errors I'm like this never happens yeah, like you, or elsewhere uh, in in the zipple output okay. uh, zipple yeah. I'm like 64 is a very specific number mm. you know like uh, it, 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 the, the the luck of that happening just once on a brand new drives is uh, very concerning to me and i thought well maybe this could be a firmware error that they fixed later because on right. on the hp on the hpes you update the bios efi whatever it's called mm -hmm. uh C cpm thingy that we still use from 1980s basically um and it updates the the controller as well uh apparently because it's kind of like built in in it or whatever mm -hmm. um do you so have the that ability do you have the ability to put like a Broadcom uh, HBA in there instead of using the the sys uh, driver? Uh, no, and I and opened this conversation. No, that was a very long multi-month conversation on your other big system. Uh, no, not just that. Now mm -hmm. that we know how to order these Broadcoms, I'm okay. very happy and my other customers are, but this is a government agency, which means mm -hmm. they have to write a tender and oh. some IT company <sighs> has to respond <sighs> to it. <laughs> and then the government should choose whoever is asking for the least amount of money. And you, then you we've got to run through a whole procurement process. Um, it, it, and it, it, I'm, I am only asking for, for you to be able to do this as a test oh, to, see whether, okay. to see whether or not the drives work without errors and that you actually have drive errors versus a controller error. Yes. Uh, that I can, and that's one of the things I suggested to my uh, former student. And because I was uh, 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 thinking it could be a, a, a firmware error, I asked them to check for the firmware version. It was from 2018, basically when it was manufactured. Uh, so their promise was, okay, we'll update this over the weekend, uh, hopefully. And they don't know if it should be like an, an incremental update, like if they should do like version plus, version plus, version, or if they should do, you know, just direct to the latest version. So that's well, one. Typically question. latest, if you even yeah. get firmware in the first place. Um, yeah. did, a, did a scrub clear up the errors? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. And one, as you're suspecting stuff, I mentioned D message because sometimes a physical slot can have issues and you may want to, you know, do your resilver 
swap two drives in their locations, keeping track of them and see if suddenly a different drive has errors because that, that was my next suggestion to the, know uh, if it was a connector issue. Yes. Uh, so that's the goal for my former student to do by hopefully Sunday. And if I get uh, some results on Monday, I think okay. I'll report back on next okay. week. But I guess this was a good experiment and they're very happy with, with TrueNAS. Like very okay, happy. Good. And this is this is core, not scale. They actually Correct. tried the scale. They yeah. did not like it. I can help you read the smart data output and just enlighten me. What is a sys drive? Uh, that's an H. I haven't seen that. P I S S. That's the generic SCSI free and potentially higher. HPI driver for HP crap, yep. if I remember mm, yep. correctly. Haven't seen that uh, since the uh, bad old Powell and SCSI days. The last card I had for that, that was like, oh, I have an Ultra 160 and an Ultra 320 uh, port. And yes, the, don't the, you the, want the, to the... install a, a nickel uh, methyl hydride battery before the cash? Right. Well, the point is, it's got RAID on it. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the C in SIS stands for crappy, if I'm not mistaken. Well, yeah, but okay, so it's fundamentally <laughs> a SAS drive or it's a, a pre SAS SCSI drive? No, no, it's, it's, the most SCSI uh, it's a SCSI command set and it's a specific driver, but it's kind of abstracts a vast range of chips. Okay. Because they basically speak the same protocol to get SCSI commands and responses for a RAID controller. But the point is, it's a RAID controller. It's not mm. actually HBA. So you have that yeah. abstraction between it, which is always obnoxious in ZFS. Correct. Are you passing through individual lives or are you just of them a RAID and you're asking for trouble? I think the dumbest ones supported by the driver kind of are HBAs. Hmm. But you kind of don't know. It's a it's a driver from the days of you don't want to know what the hardware does because operating systems are stupid. And let's hope your RAID driver will take care of storage for you. You know? Right, right, right. Because but that's what makes it a server. On Trinic, those drives were all passed through individually. So you uh, see yes, sir. discrete drives. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank yes, sir. you. Yes, sir. Um, I didn't, yes, sir. I, if I remember correctly, there used to be a port with licensing restrictions on it, so oh, it goodness. may not be available as a package, at least it used to be, which gets you access to more information. Yeah, that, that's not the case anymore, Young. And the I other thought, case I... is that smart tools may be able to, if you tell it basically which kind of indirection to use with i think dash d and uh, you may be able to get at all the information because it could be that otherwise you're seeing only a subset of the smart information at least it used to be like that maybe uh, things improve for once okay well uh get the right hardware <laughs> in a um, government agency, sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. Anything else? Sometimes uh, spontaneous hardware failures are your friend if you need to justify emergency purchases. Yeah, but the problem is yes. first he has to get the new equipment onto the authorized purchase list, which is a whole thing. Or a government big agencies. enough emergency that you can't go through the normal tender process. Wow. Okay. Tender loving, don't care. No. Helps if it happens at the end of the year and you have spare budget. It, that is really dangerous to annoying hardware, I've been told. Okay. Next week, uh, ZFS and budgeting. <laughs> paperwork and more That's paperwork. That's actually something which we could take up as a topic, not just as a joke. I know. To make sure that the OpenZFS wiki has good user uh, 
will the user appropriate explanations on how to size your spindle count, your spindle capacity, basically the trade-off involved and with using examples like for this range of storage and this yep. performance profile, these are the, let me explore this, the common same design space and explain why there's uh, madness or uh, gold plating on either side. <laughs> there you go. Well, gang, anything else? Thank you. Totally so, so unrelated. Much. Yes, please. But there is a apparently a um, remote uh, FOSS or pose controller, which is also named Beehive, spelled the same way. Wait, what? Yeah. What? Not, Not the sprinkler thing or the sprinkler thing? It. I mean, it's it's a it's a faucet timer. Maybe. Oh, the so. faucet timer. Yes, correct. Uh, that yeah. is. Um, I think they have a hyphen, but it is mighty similar. And well, it looks like a dot. Oh, okay, yep. Uh, um, this is what happens when the first page of Google doesn't have the results that you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, yeah. If you want to share uh, after the recording, interesting IoT horror stories. I uh, <laughs> wow. re regarding. Uh, Bitly garden host timers. Um, yeah, but it's totally off topic. Yeah, that's true. It's the B hyphen hive gen two. Well, thank you everyone. Like and subscribe, and I can stick around a few minutes, but not many. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.